Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India students and welcome to this module. In the previous module, we have discussed intersectionality. In the current module as well as in the next module, we would look at how the ideas related with intersectionality were prominently present in certain black American writers. In this current module, we would look at the work of Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks has written more than 30 books. However, in the current module, we would be basing our arguments only on those prominent books which are related with her ideas of gender. We find that she has also written about pedagogy, education, media in the larger context of white supremacy. In the current module, we would focus on that work of Bell Hooks which is significant for us to understand the development of gender as we find it today. Bell Hooks was born as Gloria J. Watkins in 1952. She is an African American writer, feminist and social activist. During her early 20s, she had taken up the pseudonym of Bell Hooks. It was the name of her great grandmother. She has adopted this pen name to honor the female legacies and she decided to spell it in lower case only, as she wanted to emphasize her message rather than her identities. Her writings are focused on the interconnectivity of race, class and gender and the ability of these identities to produce and perpetuate systems of oppression and domination. In the 1980s, Bell Hooks had established a support group for black women which was called the Sisters of the Yam. The same name was also used as a title of a book by her which was published in 1993. This support group as well as this book later on celebrate black sisterhood. Bell Hooks had the opinion that well known definitions of feminism privilege only the white bourgeois women. And these definitions ignore the interconnections of social classifications which are also able to add repressive angles to the positioning of black women. Feminism had started as a movement to end sexist oppression, but according to Bell Hooks, it should be better defined as a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation and oppression. She finds that this definition states that feminism is not about being anti-male. It makes clear that the problem which is faced by women is not men but sexism. However, we must also remember that all of us whether male or female have been socialized from birth on to accept sexist thought and action. One of the most significant contributions of Bell Hooks is her approach to defining the diverse movement that feminism happens to be. Bell Hooks is able to identify that if there are oppressed people, there are oppressors also. She also recognizes the fact that a woman can also be sexist as much as a man can be. However, this cannot be taken to justify male domination. But it definitely shows that it would be wrong for the feminist thinker to think that the feminist movement is as simple as being a woman against men. She also feels that the wrong notions of what feminism is 
has been projected by patriarchal mass media. The misunderstandings about feminist politics do not reflect the reality, but the fact that most of the people are able to understand its meaning only through mass media which is patriarchal in its notions. Even before intersectionality was coined as a word and later on became a buzzword in feminist circle, we find that bell hooks has talked about the interlocking webs of operation much earlier. I began to use the phrase in my work, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, because I wanted to have some language that would actually um, remind us continually of the, the, the interlocking systems of domination that define our reality and not to just have one thing be like, you know, gender is the important issue, race is the important issue. But for me, the use of that, that particular jargonistic phrase was a way, a sort of shortcut way of saying all of these things actually are functioning simultaneously at all times in our lives. And that if I really want to understand what's happening to me right now at this moment in my life as a black female of a certain age group, I won't be able to understand it if I'm only looking through the lens of race. I won't be able to understand it if I'm only looking through the lens of gender. I won't be able to understand it if I'm only looking at white, how white people see me. I mean, one of the, one of the, the to me, uh, an important breakthrough um, I felt in, in my work and that of others was the call to use the term white supremacy over racism because racism in and of itself did not really allow for a discourse of colonization and decolonization, the recognition of the internalized racism within um, people of color. And it was always, in a sense, keeping things at the level at which whiteness and white people remained at the center of the discussion. So Bell Hooks has looked at the prevailing definitions of feminism as reductive as well as dismissing of the prevailing social reality, suggesting that neither men nor women across race and class lines are not equal. And therefore, the emphasis of feminist movement to make women as social equals of men is also a misunderstanding. She instead focuses on sexist exploitation at large. She is able to include heterosexist, hierarchical gender sexual roles and sexual exploitation as it occurs across the intersections of race, class and gender. So she suggests that feminism needs to be more focused on the systematic roots of oppression. She has used the term white supremacy over racism because in her opinion, in and itself, racism does not allow for a discourse of colonization and decolonization. At the same time, it does not recognize the internalized racism within people of color. It has also kept whiteness and white people at the center of the discussion. Bill Hook's most famous work remains to be the 1981 published book, Ain't I a Woman, Black Women and Feminism. It is considered to be a groundbreaking monograph which she describes as a love gift from me to black women. It analyzes the unique experiences of black women in America from the days of the slavery to the contemporary times in a highly passionate manner. She examines the effect of racism and sexism on black women, on civil rights movement and also on feminist movement. The title of the essay, as well as the essay itself, echoes Sojourner Truth's legendary speech at a women's rights convention in 1851 in Akron, Ohio. Bell Hooks suggests that the black feminist perspective must have a sensitivity towards the fact that black women have to live through oppression in different ways. They have to face racial, sexual and class oppression simultaneously. Existing feminist movement, in her opinion, had offered no fundamental critique of the patriarchal status quo. 
So they consist of women who wish merely to fill the shoes of the men who block their way instead of devising alternative social structures without which a true equality or a true emancipation would not be possible. And therefore, in our opinion, feminism is both racist and classist because white American women are socialized to be racist, classist and even sexist. Instead of acting as surrogate men, white women should seek further growth and change. And the true sisterhood can be achieved only when all women are able to disengage themselves from the hostility, jealousy and competition with one another, which makes all of them vulnerable, weak and unable to envision new realities. This book by Bill Hooks is based on a decade long analysis of the relationship between patriarchy, sexism and capitalism. It is also linked with systems of slavery and imperialism. It has been started in the antebellum south where slavery, racism and sexism worked symbiotically to create an overreaching system of institutionalized domination and oppression. It also draws our attention to the sexual division of labor within slave culture. Nothing how noting how both whites and blacks were engaged in sexual politics that systematically devalued black women. Bell Hooks is one of the first major critics to draw our attention towards the fact that black women were also systematically exploited by the black men during the days of slavery. And I quote from her. The area that most reveals the differentiation between the status of male slaves and female slaves is the work area. The black male slave was primarily exploited as a laborer in the fields. The black female was exploited as a laborer in the fields, a worker in the domestic household, a breeder and as an object of white male sexual assault." Unquote. Bell Hooks has remarked that black men and women embodied the effects of patriarchal power in slavery. And she tries to draw our attention to the internal and external relations of personal identity formation within an evolving capitalist social order where the relations between men and women are not immune from productive capitalist forces. And in her evaluation, the master-slave dialectic also becomes exposed in the domestic sphere also. It is not limited only to the external world which is controlled by the white men, but also within the homes where black women are exploited by the black men. So within the sphere of home, we find that men and women mediate their unequal power relations in the more significant racist capitalist group politics. Black men with a penchant for the white male capitalist power which has been denied to them in the workplace systematically attempt to recuperate a sense of manhood in the house and in the process they insult and exploit their women folk. Despite accepting that we find that bell hooks does not demonize men as the primary source of exploitation or domination within the social milieu. In a state, she understands that the patriarchal power of black men is symptomatic of the macro politics of race and class within the totality of capitalist social relations. Another book which I would refer to in my discussions is Bell Hooks 1984 publication Feminist Theory from Margin to Center, in which she has questioned the existing feminist discourse again by pointing out the lack of a compact definition of feminism and of the predominance of white privileged feminists in the movement. Here she talks about interlocking webs of oppression. This is exactly what intersectionality is. She proposes a framework for evaluating culture which starts off with the black working class experience in order to examine common representations and images through interrogation techniques such as oppositional gazing. In almost Bukolian terms, 
she presents the idea of oppositional gaze in her 1992 essay, The Oppositional Gaze, Black Female Spectators. She looks at the idea of the oppositional gaze as a way for people to resist the dominant images and messages that convey to them their devalued status. Again, very much like Foucault, we find that Hooks also describes the gaze as a site of resistance for the colonized black people, not only in America, but globally. Subordinates in different relations of power learn through their experiences that there are different types of cases. There is a critical gaze or one that looks to document, one that is oppositional. In resistance struggle, the power of the dominated to assert agency by claiming and cultivating awareness politicizes looking relations. One learned to look a certain way in order to resist. Available records of the times of slavery system tell us that several times black people were punished simply because they had looked at their white masters. This particular type of gaze is also prominently displayed in the cinemas which depict the slavery systems. Crossing the border entails looking at the points of view of other races, classes and sexes. One joins a struggle as subjects and never as objects. Crossing border demands a questioning of the historical erasers of women of color in different socio-political settings, not only during the slavery system, but also outside America. Feminism is unable to see beyond its own very western scope and therefore it has failed to envision ways to unite across cultures and oceans and borders that are not reductive, assimilating or imperialist. So we can say that Hooke's definition of feminism does not privilege any race or class or a gendered group. In a post-feminist stance, Hooke's feel that it is vital that a theory bears a policy may or multiple meanings. Hooke's also feels that power is conditioned by existing social hierarchies, what she refers to as white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Within the social paradigm, power is always distributed unevenly and in an indelible manner. For example, men have power, women are powerless. Hooke's positions differs fundamentally from liberal or progressive tendencies which focus on sexism only. She has focused on the intersectional aspects of exploitation, focusing on women as well as on men in different situations. She views racism, class exploitation and sexism as mutually constitutive, but she does not presuppose that the elimination of any one-ism can resolve the other contradictions. In order to resolve contradictions, we have to look at the totality of the picture. Her feminist theory is also not anti-male, but it does oppose patriarchy. It is not against whites, but at the same time, it happens to be anti-racist. Bell Hooks also feels that sexism is experienced by most people, either as a discriminator or discriminated against, as an exploiter or exploited. And therefore, sexism is the arbiter of all other operations. Sexist operation has to be eradicated because it shapes and determines relationships of power, not only in the society, but also in our familiar spaces, in our private lives, in the most intimate context that is our home and family. And therefore, we find that feminist theory and praxis has to be grounded in these spaces too. She suggests that family relations are often informed by an acceptance of a politic of domination. They are simultaneously relations of care and connection and it is this convergence of two contradictory impulses. On the one hand, we find that there is an urge to promote growth and at the same time, there is also an urge to inhibit this growth. 
and it provides a practical setting for feminist critique, resistance and transformation. She believes that a feminist praxis cannot stand in isolation from what takes place outside institutional settings. It is fundamentally and inextricably linked to life histories and experiences that give rise to human subjectivities and social relationships. To further her argument, Bell Hooks also presents a critique of Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, which was published in 1963 and is considered to be a milestone in feminist criticism. Bell Hooks finds that the definitions of feminism which are prevalent are limiting. And she also suggests that Friedan has also failed to consider the plight of women from other classes or races. For example, the plight of black American women. In her book, The Feminine Mystique, Friedan has pointed out a problem which has no name. And this is the widespread unhappiness of women in the America of 1950s and early 1960s the decades immediately after the Second World War. She has looked critically at the educational system which promoted sexism. She has also looked at the media projected images of a happy woman, the advertisements. And she suggested that the unhappiness of those housewives who are otherwise are living in material comfort and follow the social norms of being married, of being with children, is still have an inner vacancy. And this exists because many of them had to lose their own identities owing to widespread social perceptions. While Frieden speaks of the white bourgeois married woman's desire to break away from the chains of household labor, she, according to Bill Hooks, does not speak of the needs of those women who do not have men who do not have children, who do not even have any homes. She ignores the existence of all those women who are non-white and who are also poor and perhaps do not have the advantage of education. And therefore, she feels that freedom's theory is discriminatory, making the white bourgeois woman's plight the center of feminist discourse. This is a reiteration of Hooke's belief that the feminist experiences of white women is an adequate perspective on the collective realities of women. And limiting feminist theory to the discourse on gender also cannot be a solid foundation for theorizing. According to her, those women who are marginalized, who belong to the marginalized classes or races for example, should make use of their spatial vantage points and take a look at the dominant, I quote, racist, classes, sexist hegemony as well as to envision and create a counter hegemony, unquote. According to Bill Hooks, revolutionary feminism can indeed make a difference through unnecessary struggle and a fostering of critical potential consciousness change is possible. In order to do this, there should be a global revolution of sustained freedom, justice and peace which should be anchored on every individual's self-actualization. Another significant book by Bell Hooks is Talking Back, Thinking Feminist, Thinking Black which, which was published in 1989. This also helps us to contextualize contemporary understandings of gender. This is a collection of personal and theoretical essays in which Hooks has reflected on her signature issues, racism, feminism, politics as well as pedagogy. She has written about the oppression of black women and their cravings to speak in their own voice, to find out their own language in order to represent their own identity. So, Hooks discusses the struggle of self-identification, self-representation and self-realization of marginalized group. Among her discovery is that moving from silence into a speech is for the oppressed a gesture of defiance that heals them, makes possible a new life 
and a new growth. Hook suggests that conventionally silence is viewed as the right speech for the oppressed. Silence is interpreted as one's inability to speak for oneself, to object to practices of domination and inability to challenge the existing social hierarchy. However, talking back is to speak like an equal to an authority figure to challenge these practices. The context of silence is varied and it is also multidimensional. It can be found within different contexts within family, community or society. Silencing happens almost everywhere. We live in a world in crisis, a world governed by politics of domination according to her. Silence itself is not the lack of speaking, in a state it has to be understood as an act of submission. And to overcome this submission means not only to emerge from silence into his speech, but also a sustained effort to make this speech heard and only then one can think of challenging acts of oppression. Hooks recalls her own childhood days when speaking as an equal to an authority figure was considered to be an act of daring. During her childhood, it was thought that children are meant to be seen and not heard. However, one should not think that women were necessarily silent. They used language in different ways. Women in home sphere in her own communities were often talking. They were giving orders, threatening people, threatening each other, fussing. Whereas men appear to be either absent or silent. And to a young bell hooks, the language of these women seemed so rich and so highly poetic that she did not want to be isolated from it. However, but the voices of these women were either soliloquies or they were talking into thin air. The talking to ears that did not hear, the talk that is simply not listened to and this was the talk of the women. So while not silenced, the women also did not have a voice. At best it could be understood as a background noise whether they were pleading for something or giving orders or even making threats. They did not have any agency in this voice. So talking back in this context could be a loud but powerless speech silenced in its insignificance despite its burden of keeping structure within various private spheres. The most evident perception of dialogue according to Hooks in which speech is shared and recognized in its intimacy, joyfulness and wit etc which is filled with the power of discourse occurred among the black women in her life. By understanding the varied ways in which black women's speech is confined to being a background noise, we can again understand the differences that many black women face in moving from talking back to their mothers and the transformative talking back of feminist consciousness. Hooks feel that the silence of black women is felt not only in their domestic spheres, but also in the public sphere of black feminist thinking, writing and also activism. For example, she has pointed out the fact of lesser participation of black women in the second wave feminism either as a critical theory or as a movement. Describing the suppression of speech that had characterized her home life, she argues that we must understand acts of suppression of speech, the breakdown of spirit and persecution as these occur in the public sphere as well, especially to those who are made voiceless by systems of oppression. The speech which according to bell hooks questioned the authority and brought issues of pain and vulnerability to the forefront was also identified as crazy speech and it was also a speech that betrayed the privacy as well as the primacy of the home sphere. Continuing her argument further, Bell Hooks suggests that black women are often characterized 
either as angry or demanding or limited in their knowledge and therefore they face a tremendous battle to speak and to write in public space in a hope of being heard. Another book which is significant in this context is the 1993 publication Sisters of the Yam, Black Women and Self Recovery. So, she looks at how the emotional health of black women has always been impacted by the prevalent issues of sexism and racism. Yam is a symbol of joy, of self healing as well as it reminds us of the experiences of black womanhood. So, as black women heal their individual wounds, they become better able to cope with the process of collective healing which is needed for transformational change in different societies. A contemporary interpretation of Yam which used to be a staple diet for most of the African people includes nourishment, comfort as well as emotional and psychological healing through symbolic connections with their legacies. In the introduction to the book, Hooks discusses the healing powers which are present within individuals that are augmented and further nurtured through collective activities and therefore, she has titled the book Sisters of the Yam to underscore the significance of support groups. In her 2000 book, Feminism is for Everybody, Hooks argues for feminist theories importance to feminist discourses. She again examines the interlocking nature of gender, race and class, what has now come to be known as intersectionality. Hooks had defined feminism as a movement to end sexism, sexist exploitation and oppression. The book also highlights the fact that Bell looks at sexism as the enemy. She does not consider men to be the enemy of a woman. In the chapter 7 of this book, Hooks has been able to link class and behavior, how women are taught expectations about their behavior and how they understand and resolve problems. In propagating her ideas in this context, Hooks has drawn from the works of Rita Brown, Betty Friedan, Mary Barfoot, Bunch, Nancy Mayen, etc., as well as from her own previously published works, particularly Feminist Theory from Margin to Center. She critiques the notion that the economic gains of affluent females are a positive sign for all women. Hooks presents an interesting idea that freedom of privileged class women of all races has required the sustained subordination of working class and poor women. She says that more money does not mean more freedom if our finances are not used to facilitate well-being. She also suggests that feminist liberation is should be linked to a vision of social change which should challenge class elitism. So, Hooks has been able to connect theory with practice, highlighting also the fact that a woman can also be a sexist and suggesting the strong need of sisterhood. She also argues that feminism cannot succeed without the participation of men in the movement and men can exist as worthy comrades in struggle because feminism is anti-sexism, not anti-male. This idea is very close to the initial formalization of feminist theory by Simone de Boer. She also concludes that enlightened feminists see that men are not the problem, rather patriarchy, sexism and male domination remain to be the problem in the society. Her book, We Real Cool, contains 10 essays on black males. The title alludes to a 1959 poem by Brooks. Like Brooks, Hooks also worries about men in her life, black men experiencing crisis of masculinity as prisoners of patriarchal imperialism. She talks about how black men are compelled to repress themselves in, in an America which is dominantly white. They are taught violence and aggression as their keys to survival. Belluc suggests that black masculinity is a reflection of white domination and is able to provide some alternative solutions to black men as well as women who should be able to work together. 
to overcome the damage and hurt. She points at the media portrayals of black men as being basically fierce and ruthless. Mainstream culture inculcates fear of black men, rewarding them most when they act out the native son role of a brutal psychopath, confirming the social fears. Bellux also suggests that the development of racist and sexist attitudes in American culture have contributed to the criminalization and dehumanization of black males. She has looked at various media publications including George Jackson's Soul Dead Brother and Stephen King's Rita Hayworth and Shashank Redemption. She attacks the stereotypes also of older black women as being powerful matriarchs, fiercely independent of men. And she suggests that most black women are more than willing to surrender control over their heart and resources to the men in their lives in different relationships. When she looks at black masculinity in contemporary American society, she points out two main problems. First is the still existing pejorative stereotypes about black men being animals, brutes, etc., etc. Not only do these stereotypes degrade and harm black men in general, they are also explicitly limiting their opportunities to express themselves socially, economically, sexually and individually. So, these negative stereotypes have harmed the concept of black masculinity in the same way as we have seen earlier, a stereotype harming the concept of femininity for black women. Secondly, the prevailing notions of manhood remains to be the conservative ideal of masculinity based on the values of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. This includes building a family, providing for them, being in charge of the finances, etc. Also, a man should not be able to show emotions or weaknesses. So, race and class play a role in a white capitalist patriarchal society. Hooke believes in intersectional feminism. She examines how feminism can change the lives of people for the better. She is able to show the effect of class, gender, race, etc., among other factors on the lives of black people. Examining the core issues of feminism and its positive promise to eliminate sexism, sexual exploitation and oppression, she thinks that the feminist theories should speak to more than just those in the ivory tower. She feels that the feminist theory should be able to acknowledge the experiences of all human beings across borders, not only women, but men also. We would close the discussion here. We would continue our discussion of those black American thinkers and writers who have been able to predate the concept of intersectionality. Thank you.